Now, just over three weeks ago, we introduced you to Lewis Pugh. Back then, he was gearing up for the swim of a lifetime and grinning about it, aiming to become the first person to swim the classical seven seas and all inside a month. Well, I'm happy to say Lewis has done it. The final leg of his 200-kilometre swim ended today in London. Along the way, he's helped raise awareness about the need for protected areas in the world's oceans. I'll be speaking to him shortly, but first, let's take a look at his remarkable journey. The plight of the world's oceans is widely documented, but few have gone to the lengths Lewis Pugh has to highlight the issue. The environmental campaigner has completed many pioneering challenges and has now become the first person to complete a long-distance swim in the seven seas of the ancient world. We've just been for a swim, and the biggest fish I've seen is literally this size. His latest effort has seen Lewis tackle the likes of the Mediterranean, the Adriatic and Aegean, and he's even rubbed shoulders with foreign royalty. Over the past 27 years, he's also tackled some of the world's most hostile waters, including the Antarctic and in the Himalayas. He was the first ever person to swim across the North Pole. It means Lewis has witnessed a lot of marine devastation firsthand, seeing litter on seabeds and diminishing sea life. And with every country he visits, he attempts to highlight the need for marine protected areas, essentially national parks in the seas. We've got to try and persuade policymakers around all these seas how important this is, that we care about what's happening in the oceans. Today, Lewis completed his latest challenge by swimming up the Thames to Westminster. Now, and the man himself joins me now, and he just toweled himself off and changed out of his speedos, Lewis. Uh, how are you? Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, tired. I can imagine. Um, what was the hardest bit? Definitely coming up from, uh, from the North Sea up, in, uh, up into London. Uh, what you have is we had a wind coming down the, the, um, the, the Thames and, and tide coming the opposite way, and so it was very, very choppy. Just what you don't need. I mean, it, obviously, it's a tidal river, or at least yeah. it, is, uh, it is that far up. I mean, were you sort of veering all over the Thames as you were doing it because of that? Well, I, I was restricted where I, where I could swim because I had to swim out of the, swimming, out, out of the uh, shipping lanes. But it, it, it was a tough swim, you know. I'd just come the, the day before I'd done my swim in Oman in the Arabian Sea. Nice, warm, beautiful, underneath <laughs> me, turtles and everything. And then you come up and to, to, to do the North Sea swim where the water was about 14 degrees, so it's so a cold. We saw you just before you started, so just take us through the route and, and the seas that you did. Yes, yeah, so the first swim was in the Mediterranean, and I then went to the, uh, the Aegean, to the Adriatic, to the Black Sea, to the Red Sea, Look to there, the Arabian Sea. Look there, holiday makers, it looks like. Yes, yeah, so that's, that. that's the first swim which I did in the Mediterranean. Uh, good start. It, a very good start, but what was so eye-opening was the health of these seas. Uh, throughout the whole swim, the biggest fish that I saw was literally the size of a 30-centimeter ruler. I didn't see any fish, anything bigger than that. The majority were just the size of my hand. I didn't see any sharks, didn't see any dolphins, didn't see any whales. Uh, these seas are amongst the most overfished in the whole world. You're talking about sharks. It's sad that you didn't see them. Well, obviously, you wouldn't necessarily want to see any, but it's yeah. sad that they're not there because they've been fished. Yeah. Uh, it's estimated that over 100 million sharks are fished out of the oceans every single year. And you work that down on a daily basis, it's over a quarter of a million are slaughtered every single day. Uh, and f sharks are obviously important because they're a predator species. Everything underneath it relies on these animals. Uh, we are at a tipping point now in our oceans. And the reason why I stopped at the Thames Barrier was because this was built 30 years ago. And it, and it was a, a structure was, which was built because of vision. They estimated that unless they built this thing, London would flood. But they estimated it would only be two or three times a year. This year alone, it's been used 48 times. And so what I'm saying to, to the policy leaders all over the world, but especially here in the United Kingdom, if we had the leadership and the vision to create something like that, we now also need to have the vision and leadership to create national parks in our oceans. The Thames is, well, Londoners think it's pretty dirty, but where, where was the dirtiest place you swam? Uh, probably in the Aegean. Uh, I swam just outside Athens in, in a port called Piraeus. Underneath me was everything. It was car tires, it was bottles, it was, uh, you name it, it was underneath me. Everything that wasn't sea life. What was extraordinary, though, was swimming in the Red Sea. In the Red Sea, underneath me was coral, beautiful coral of every single color and description, blue and green and orange, and just, it was absolutely beautiful tropical fish. Two, just two kilometers outside that marine protected area is exactly the same as the Aegean tires, bottles, mm. 
Great adventure, the latest of many. Just very briefly, what have you got planned next? Probably a long lie down. Well, these are the big seven seas. There are a lot more which are, to be honest, even more endangered. And I plan now to go out into other seas. I'll disclose them shortly, but uh, more swimming in some very, very cold places. We look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, very well done. Glad you could join us again. Go and enjoy yourself. Don't have a swim for a while. Lewis, thanks very much indeed.